Alright, hello. Welcome to this beautiful spring Wednesday. Uh, hope everyone is, is doing well. Uh, reminder that the Lab Zero check-in post to on Moodle uh, by 9 p.m. tonight. A lot of great uh, posts and, and questions there so far, so good thing to, to check out as you work on the lab. Uh, any questions about the lab or any of the C and, and memory stuff that we've been looking at? All right, so today we're going to kind of leave uh, C behind for the time being and focus on how our numbers, and in particular integers, represented in a computer's memory. Uh, we know that when we have an, an int, it has a fixed width. What is, what is that, that width? Four, by, four bytes. Four bytes. Uh, we also have, have eight byte integers. And so we're going to look at how do we arrange the, the bits in those four bytes to represent different numbers. It's worth taking a moment to ask, why do we care? I mean, some, someone has to care. We need some way to represent numbers. But um, this is a pretty low-level implementation detail, and not one necessarily that uh, you have to constantly be thinking about in practice. So one reason is, as we saw last week first uh, in, our, in our first meeting, uh, we can multiply 200 by 300 by 400 by 500 and get a large negative number. Uh, and so understanding when and how behavior like that occurs uh, can be very important. Um, some other kind of, uh, uh, another kind of practical side of it is that uh, an expensive European Space Agency rocket literally exploded in 1996 uh, due to a software crash that was caused when they convert when the software converted a 64-bit floating point number to a 16-bit signed integer. So there were parts of the program that were just working with different numerical representations and this unfortunately caused the rocket to explode. People also, fortunately before it actually caused the problem, found a software flaw in the Boeing 787 uh, that if this piece of software had been running continuously for close to a year, uh, pilots could lose complete control of the airplane. Uh, and this was likely because this counter uh, would overflow, something we'll talk about today, and the system did not account for this possibility. So there's some practical reasons why we care. Uh, there's also a kind of a more philosophical reason, at least that I'll argue why we should care. Uh, and that is because in your education here uh, at Carleton and, and in courses like 2A specifically, we're trying to look inside things and understand how they work. And we're not going to be satisfied by just sort of waving our hands and say, the bits are arranged in some way. It works. We're not going to think about it. Um, we want to take this opportunity to kind of open these black boxes, understand what's going on inside, and while the details of integer representation maybe aren't the most broadly applicable, uh, the idea of encoding comes up all the time. The idea that we have uh, some set of things we want to represent, and we have to come up with some system of, say, encoding each of the different things we want to represent in binary or in some kind of lower level structure. All right, so the first uh, idea I want to talk about is bit weight. Uh, pretty straightforward. Just the idea that if we have four places, a four-bit binary number, and each of these bits gets a weight, kind of an amount that it contributes to the overall number, 
uh, where R in the first place would have a weight of 1, the next place a weight of 2, the next place a weight of 4, the next place a weight of 8. Uh, this is sort of the value of the place uh, of a particular bit we're going to call the bit's weight. And so if I had, if I filled this in with some specific bits, then I can look and say, and if the, if I'm just interpreting this by taking each bit that is a 1 and using its weight, I have 8 plus 4 plus 1 is 13. Does this make sense? Any questions on this bit weight? All right, so from bit weight, uh, Paul is pretty naturally to talk about unsigned integers. Uh, integers meaning that they're not negative, they're zero, they're positive or, or zero. And when we're talking about unsigned integers, very straightforward, we just take the weight of each bit that's one, that's the value of the unsigned integer. So to do a four bit example, where on the inside here, I'm going to write the, the four bit patterns, 0, 0, 0, 0, take each of these and figure out what is the unsigned, uh, uh, what unsigned integer does it represent. And you might expect 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 7, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this is our, if we have four bits, these are the unsigned integers we can make. Um, any observations about this set of integers as it relates to the fact that we have four bits to represent them? Yeah, there is 16 of them. Yeah, when we had four bits, they give us 16 different unsigned integers that we could represent. Um, and if we were to write down a relationship between the n bits and the number of possible unsigned integers uh, that we can make, any guesses for you know, what that relationship would be? Exactly. We have n bits. We can make 2 to the n uh, integers. How about our maximum unsigned integer? Is there a way we could express that in terms of n? Next. 2 to the n quantity minus 1. Exactly. That when we have n bits, and our maximum is going to be all ones, that will give us 2 to the n minus 1 as our maximum value. Uh, so 
what do we get uh, if I have four ones, 15, plus 0001, which is 1? Back to zero. Exactly. Uh, and this is because we only have four bits, and what this would actually give us, we would add these up, we'd keep carrying a one, we'd end up with 16, a one and four zeros, but we only have four bits, and so we just kind of throw away anything that falls outside of that, of those four bits. Uh, and another way to put this is that uh, when we're doing this kind of fix with arithmetic, it is modular, meaning that uh, we're just going to kind of travel around this circle, kind of coming back around to the start when we overflow, when we go over uh, uh, the maximum that we can represent. What are your questions on? What is it? Um, so I was wondering if it was, uh, like a, I guess a big engineering system, would you keep the first four as opposed to the last four? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, do we have to think about the kind of endianness when we're, we're dealing with this? Uh, fortunately, no. Um, little endian versus big endian, the only thing it affects is just how we arrange the bytes in memory. It doesn't affect arithmetic, it doesn't affect what values things represent, it's just about we have to pick an order to put the bytes in memory. Uh, so we can always throw away what carries out uh, regardless. Other questions? All right, so things get a little more interesting when we move on to signed integers. And I want to present two different strategies for representing signed integers to you. And I'm going to ask you to kind of think about the, the pros and cons of these two strategies. So the first is called sign and magnitude. Uh, and it's perhaps what kind of what might come to mind if you uh, just thought how would you how would you represent positive and negative numbers? And The kind of sign part of sign and magnitude is we're going to use the most significant bit to indicate whether the number is positive, that's when the most significant bit is zero, or that the number is negative, the most significant bit is one. And to treat the remaining bits as kind of an unsigned integer, and then we'll apply the sign given by our most significant or our, our this is often called the sign bit. So this would mean that uh, if we wanted to make three, we would have 0, 0, 1, 1. Is this yellow color visible, by the way? All right, great. Uh, and if we want negative 3, we have a 1 in the most significant place, but otherwise also this has 3. Does that make sense? Yeah. How would you distinguish if it's like negative 3 and not 
Yes, that is, that is an excellent question. How do we know whether to uh, treat the bits as an unsigned integer or the signed integer? Uh, the answer is, as far as the bits in memory go, it could be either. There's nothing in memory to tell us this is unsigned versus signed. Uh, and it's just, is our program, in like, is it of a type uh, int or is it of type unsigned int? It's going to kind of tell the compiler how to interpret those bits, kind of what to do with them. Yeah, right. But if you have like two signed integers and one's negative three and one's positive 11, could you distinguish between them at all? Even if they're like both signed? Um, so this is a, a, a useful point. Could we make positive 11 with our four bit sign of magnitude? Yes. I would say you couldn't because they're they're signed. They if you're dealing with signed, I would say you you can only deal with signed, right? If you have like a, a signed bit, you're you're if you're into signed integers, then they're all gonna be signed, no matter what. Yeah, that that we like with our sign of magnitude and our four bits, like positive eleven just like doesn't exist because we're going to interpret it as a negative number because it will have a one in the most significant bit. Yeah. Uh, isn't the problem that you have two representation of zero? Yeah. So now we're getting into like pros and cons of sign of magnitude. I'm going to ask you to to discuss with with your neighbors in a minute. But yes, whether we have multiple representations of zero certainly important. So before we get to that, I want to talk about the alternative to sign of magnitude. And that is a representation called two's complement. And uh, this says Two's complement, our most significant bit, rather than just being like positive sign, negative sign, is going to count as its negative weight. And then all other bits will be the positive weight. So again, for our three, that's unchanged from both unsigned and signed magnitude. We don't have, we just have a, a two and a one. But to make negative 3, we need to have the most significant be 1. That has to be true to get a negative number, because that's the bit that will have negative weight. So then we have negative 8. And to get to negative 3, we would need uh, a positive 5. So we have negative 8 plus 4 plus 1 gives us negative 3. So that's our 2's complement. Questions on these kind of, yeah, huh. What's the advantage of using two's complement? Excellent question. You are going to discuss this with your neighbors. Um, brainstorm what are possible kind of uh, advantages or disadvantages from these, these two approaches. Uh, it may be helpful when discussing this uh, to think about a few points. It may be helpful to try and fill in uh, a, uh, a circle like this. Uh, but think about what are the range of values that can be represented under these two systems. You might think about how it might work to add two numbers together under, uh, under these two systems. 
And uh, you might also uh, consider, are there particular operations you imagine might be more efficient using one or the other? So uh, we'll take about uh, five minutes for you to brainstorm with your neighbors about uh, advantages or disadvantages to, to our two signed integer methods. <laughs> Let's uh, let's talk about uh, what we think about these two approaches. Uh, what's uh, what's the potential consideration that came up uh, in your in your brainstorm? <laughs> Um, the sign and unsigned, it's uh, 10. They only have a, a maximum positive negative value of 7. Yeah, so uh, if we think about um, the, uh, filling this, this in, um, if we look at kind of the largest positive value, um, like that's going to be 7. Uh, what's our largest negative value under sine and magnitude? Negative 7. Uh, negative 7, I think that would be here. What's our largest negative value under 2's complement? Yeah. Negative 8. Uh, and where would that be on this orbit? Um, 1, 0, 0, 0. Yes, we have uh, a 1 and less than anything a bit, that's negative 8, and then 0 is beyond that. So this is one difference that we're seeing between these two. In uh, 2's complement, we can go from 7 through negative 8. In sine and magnitude, we go from 7 through negative 7. So why, why do we... Why does sine and magnitude have one fewer uh, in this range back? Right? Uh, because there's two different ways to represent zero. Yeah, we have our zero here. Uh, and where is our where's our other zero for sine and magnitude? It's where the, um, the negative eight is for two functions. Exactly. So when we have sine and magnitude, we have this unfortunate situation where we have zero and negative zero. We really don't need two zeros or need to have a zero that's negative. Um, yeah, so that's sort of an unfortunate flaw of, of sine and magnitude. Um, other things that came up in your discussion. It's significantly easier to find the absolute value with sine and magnitude because you just always keep the most significant digit zero. You don't need to do any checking. Mm -hmm. But with two's complement, if the most significant value is a one, you need to flip every single bit. Yeah, so there are, that's a good point. There are some things for which our sine and magnitude is definitely simpler uh, because the most significant bit is not contributing anything to the value other than the sign. Uh, and it's an interesting point that to say get the uh, get the absolute value of um, uh, to get the absolute value of a two's complement. Uh, uh, negative number, there's like some work that we have to do. Um, and that's going to be, be something that we, we look at uh, later on is, is if we have uh, some value x in two's complement, how do we go about finding negative x in some, like what's our algorithm for finding negative x uh, under two's complement? Um, other, other things that came up. What about a 
arithmetic. Um, if, uh, if I add, so let's say I have uh, negative 3 uh, in sine and magnitude, and if I want to do negative 3 plus 1 in sine and magnitude versus doing it in 2's complement. So can I just take the bits for 1 and take the bits for negative 3 and add them together? For 2's complement, yes. Yeah, so I can't do that for sine and magnitude, because if I just do that, I end up with something that looks like negative 4. And negative 3 plus 1 should not be negative 4. Uh, so I can't just do like normal, like add, add the bits the way that I can do with unsigned integers for sine and magnitude. But if I look at adding 1 and negative 3 in 2's complement, I end up with negative 8 and 6, or negative 2, which is exactly what I would want when I add 1 to negative 2. Question? Okay. Um, other question, questions on like why we, uh, on this kind of arithmetic? There's kind of another nice property that comes out of 2's complement uh, in this sense. Because uh, when we go, like when we have negative 8 and we add 1, we would expect to get negative 7. And in fact, the representation for negative 7 is kind of our bits for negative 8 kind of incremented by 1. And so our negative numbers kind of increment in sort of the same direction that our positive numbers increment under 2's complement. Uh, but if I, if we look at sine of magnitude, where They kind of go in the kind of the wrong direction in some sense. That kind of we increment positive numbers this way, but then to increment negative numbers, kind of we need to kind of decrement the uh, the binary by one. So it's very uh, it kind of simplifies a lot of arithmetic operations to have a sign representation that sort of makes negative numbers. Uh, flow in the same direction that positive numbers do. Does that make sense? So perhaps you're not surprised that uh, two's complement is the signed integer representation that's used on basically all modern computers. Uh, you won't really find sign and magnitude being used uh, uh, anywhere. However, uh, we're not going to spend, uh, when we look at, uh, uh, when, when we take a look at floating point representation, uh, we will actually see a kind of sign and magnitude approach uh, being used there. Um, all right. Yeah. Because it's take up, uh, it was four bytes, mm -hmm. right? What about all the rest of the, I mean, what about all the rest of the bits? Because this is only four bits. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going through this four-bit example because I can fit all 16 possibilities on the board. Um, but if we, we take a moment and think about our four-byte integer, uh, how many bits is, is four bytes? So, one byte, eight bits, four 
bytes is our 32 bits. And so we can kind of apply our, um, our, our what we have, have sort of recognized about the range of values that can be represented to say that unsigned goes from zero uh, uh, up to um, uh, 2 to the 32 minus 1. And our sign uh, would, uh, we can see for four bits, it went from a negative 2 to the 3 up to positive 2 to the 3 minus 1. So put that in terms of, of n, we have negative 2 to the n minus 1 to positive 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. Okay. And we're doing, I just want to check, we're doing four bytes because integers are four bytes? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so when we have a, an int in C, it is four bytes. Uh, if we had a long, it would be eight bytes or 64 bits. And these, um, yeah, put in here, but we're talking about 32 minus 1 or 2 to the 31. Other questions on this? All right, so we'll do some practice. Uh, but before we do some practice, uh, I need to tell you uh, an important story about uh, the first national infrastructure uh, in the United States. Uh, thrilling, thrilling topic, I know. Um, so this. Uh, this story begins with who else? Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, um, who was first consul of France in the early 19th century. And uh, it also involves, uh, among other people, uh, this guy, uh, Toussaint Louverture, who was, um, uh, who lived in the uh, French colony of Saint-Domingue, which is modern day Haiti. And this colony had a large population of uh, uh, enslaved people uh, who were working on sugar plantations there. And uh, there was a, a rebellion and kind of uh, uh, slaves taking control of, uh, of the island. And uh, Napoleon sends uh, a military expedition from France to uh, the island of Saint-Domingue uh, to, to defeat the rebels, take control. Uh, this does not go well, um, for Napoleon, that is. Um, and uh, this sort of uh, sours him on the idea of the Americas in general. Uh, and at this point, France had a large amount of territory uh, that it uh, ostensibly controlled uh, in North America. Uh, and so following this, uh, Napoleon uh, negotiates to sell uh, this uh, large chunk of land uh, to uh, the new United States. Uh, and it was called the Louisiana Purchase. Um, this part of the purchase being Louisiana uh, in 1803. And so now the United States uh, is uh, gotten kind of a lot larger. There's more and more people headed west uh, from the kind of original colonies uh, along the coast, uh, and in particular headed west across the Appalachian Mountains. And when you're kind of uh, farming or producing things, and your only way to transport them is to put things on the back of a donkey, uh, transportation is very slow and expensive, and it's hard to move stuff. And so, uh, it's around in the first couple decades of the 1800s that uh, things like the National Road, uh, kind of the first road ever built by the national government um, uh, from the metropolis of, of Cumberland all the way to Vandalia. It was supposed to go to St. Louis, but they ran out of money. Um, uh, and kind of more important historically uh, is the Erie Canal, which was a, a canal 
uh, built between I think 1817 and 1825 that connected uh, the Great Lakes all the way across New York State to the Hudson River, uh, which then led to the sea. So uh, kind of this uh, this program of improving the internal infrastructure would become kind of one of the major political debates of uh, of these decades of kind of whether the the government should do this or should just or should just stay out of it. All right, that's our that's our history facts. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is some practice on uh, all this kind of integer stuff we've been talking about. So start out. Uh, what is the range of values we can represent with an unsigned integer of n bits? Uh, mostly thinking D, but some votes for these other ones. Please, quick discussion with your neighbors about why you chose the, the answer you did. A lot of movement toward D. That's excellent. It will be 0 up to 2 to the n minus 1. Uh, any questions on, on that? Does that make sense? All right. Now, to our 4 bit encoding, uh, I and sometimes to differentiate a number written in binary from one that's hex or base 10, you'll see 0b as like our 0x in front of hex numbers, so our binary number 1011. Which of the following of these four would not be a valid interpretation of 1011 using kind of one of the, the representations we've talked about today? All right, lots of people thinking that we can't do negative four. That's indeed going to be correct. Can someone uh, explain how you uh, recognize that negative four wasn't one that we could we could make? Here, um, for eleven, it's unsigned. That's just what the normal binary number means. Uh, if it's uh, Sign then it's negative because of the one and the two ones is negative three. It's uh, twos then the one means negative eight plus three is negative five. Exactly. But if we interpret under sign magnitude two's complement, we get either negative three or negative five, but not negative four. Uh, uh, coincidentally, isn't negative four the same in both uh, systems? One, one, zero, zero. Uh, yes, that, so that's that's true. That, and in the like normal, it would just be zero, one, zero, zero. So it definitely cannot be zero. Exactly. Uh, any questions on this one? All right. Uh, what two's complement? Now we're moving up to eight bits. Twice as many bits, so many bits. Uh, which numbers do these two 8-bit quantities represent? Uh, lots of votes for A, but a uh, few folks abstained. Uh, please discuss with your, your neighbors how you uh, went about converting each of these or figuring out what, each of, what, what number each of these uh, represented. Oh, it's unanimous for A. That's excellent. We're going to have uh, negative one and, and thirty-nine. Uh, anyone have a have a have a trick for realizing negative one besides kind of adding up a whole whole bunch of things? Uh, five. Um, if they're all ones and two's complement, it's always going to be negative one because all of, all of the positive bits after that first negative bit, they're going to cancel each other out. You're just left with. Exactly. The under two's complement will always represent negative one with all ones. Uh, another way to think about this is that negative one should be one away from zero. And all ones is what we would need in order to add one to it and get zero. Because we'll have a one sort of carry out and we'll throw that away and we'll be left with zero. Any questions on this one? 
All right, last one of these. I have, uh, this is again under two's complement. Uh, I have a four bit number, 1100. Zero, zero. Uh, which of these eight bit numbers, and I've just put a space kind of between each four bits to make them a little easier to read, uh, but the spaces are, are just to, for, for readability. Um, which of these 8-bit numbers has the same sign value as our 4-bit number here? All right, A, B, and C, all pretty popular. Please discuss with your neighbors how you how are you thinking about uh, the cross. Uh, large move towards C, that's excellent. This is the sign value. Uh, this is the 8-bit the uh, two's complement uh, number that would give us uh, a negative 4, like our 4-bit version here. Um, questions on, on this one? So this example brings up an... Uh, interesting point, which is when we go Convert a uh, sign, uh, an integer from fewer bits to to more bits. So, like we were doing there, from four bits up to eight bits, uh, or uh, more likely they from an inch to a long, from four bytes up to eight bytes. Uh, we can apply something called sign extension, which just says kind of copy out the sign bit to fill in all the new uh, all the new bits. So uh, in the example. Uh, uh, from the from the screen, we had one one zero zero. We were going up to eight bits, so we took the most significant bit, the sign bit, and just used that to fill in kind of all the higher bits in order to still get the same value, same negative four uh, that we had under four bits. Um, does this make sense? This is for two's complement. Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So this is specifically for signed integers for two's complement. Uh, if we did this with unsigned, we would change the value of the number. For unsigned, we just fill in with zeros regardless. Other question? Okay. So for the most part. Do we have to worry about the the sign of magnitude at all? So earlier you mentioned only one case, right? Uh, well, uh, on on Friday we'll talk a little bit about floating point representation, and it does use a sign of magnitude approach uh, because there's not there like some, something as elegant as two's complement like does not exist for floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are a lot messier. Um, when we get a lot of messier sign and magnitude, uh, it's useful. Uh, all right. When we convert from more bits to fewer bits, so it might sort of the other way, um, uh, this is. Um,
We just don't really have any option but to truncate or just throw away the kind of higher bits that no longer fit. Um, so, for example, if we have the value 17 as an 8 bit integer, and we need to go down to 4 bits. And all we can do is just take the lower 4 bits, truncate the number, throw away the higher ones. So it would become, it would go from being 17 to being 1. And we can't, could we preserve the value 17 going down to, to 4 bits? No, we don't have a way to represent 17 in 4 bits. So we can't preserve the value. And this gets back to uh, what I was saying about these uh, integers being modular, that with 4 bits, we have 16 possible values. 17 mod 16 is, is 1. But, uh, this is why uh, uh, it's generally dangerous to convert from, say, a larger, like a long, to an int, uh, because you might just change the value and lose and lose data. And often the compiler will warn you that you're doing this sort of conversion because it can cause problems. In in a way that going the other direction, you can always preserve the value of going the other direction. Does that make sense? All right, so let's end uh, considering uh, the idea of an additive inverse. Uh, so uh, is anyone uh, uh, familiar with the, the definition of an additive, additive inverse? Holly? Um, isn't that like the number you have to add to a certain number to go back to zero? Exactly. Exactly. So if we have x, we want to add you know, negative x in order to get zero. And so this is our additive inverse. So, uh, if we have a, say, a bit representation of uh, x, let's say we are under 8 bit 2's complement, and I have these 8 bits. What value is this? It's 1. Yeah, it's one. Uh, what would be the the bit pattern of its additive inverse? All of them should be one. Yeah, we want to have all of them one. Why is that? Exactly. We have one. We know we want negative one. Uh, what if we have? Um, Uh, something like this, um, uh, where uh, we have, uh, like this is negative 61, um, but rather than focusing on the decimal uh, equivalent, uh, we think about what is the pattern of bits that we would need to add to this in order to get to, to zero. Because that's what we're, we're looking for. Yeah. But Would it be zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one? Uh, why, why is that what you think? Because uh, it's, I mean, it would, the whole thing of it is we're not really like minusing, we're trying to push it over the, the brick and reset it to zero rather than take everything away. 
So that's enough to fill everything. It's enough to push it up to all ones and then an extra one that put it over the edge. Exactly. That, that's a nice way to think about what we're doing because we know if we have all ones, we have negative one, and we add one to it, it's going to go to zero. And so if we have some pattern of bits, we sort of want to identify what is the pattern of bits that we could add to it to get it to be all ones. And then just one more than that. As we get it to all ones, that's negative one, add one more, that gets us to zero. And so our, our additive inverse is looking at the bits that we have. And if we just flip all the bits, we take each bit and turn a 1 into a 0 and a 0 into a 1. In that case, we just flip the bits. We get this pattern. And then if we add 1 to that, that actually is going to give us our, our additive, additive inverse. So. Flipping the bits and adding one uh, is going to be kind of, uh, just uh, uh, a nice formula to get us to, to our additive, additive inverse. And as a preview of what we'll spend uh, time talking about on, on Friday is We actually have a set of operators that can perform these sort of uh, 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 transformations on a set of bits. And bitwise negation, the, it's often tilde is how we write down that operator, and it's also how we write it down in C. And so if we're now expressing our additive inverse, we'd say negative x equals Flip all the bits in x, and then add 1 to them. And so we actually don't necessarily need our unary minus operator, some separate operator to turn x into negative x. We could do it with this bitwise negation instead. All right. I think I'll leave it there for today. Next time we'll talk about floating point and more of these bitwise operations. Uh, remember to make the lab check-in post. Keep working through lab zero. Uh, I have office hours starting in about half an hour, and I'll see you on Friday. Thank you.